folks here. So welcome everyone. If this is your first time joining a History at Home program with the Montclair History Center, we do these about once a month. Um, we do record and we will put this up on our YouTube channel. So if someone you know missed it or if you want to check out other programs we've done, you are welcome to take a look at our YouTube channel and I'll put a link to that in the chat for you. Um, lots of content on there. Um, so tonight's presentation, um, we're really thrilled um, to welcome archaeologist Will Williams with us. Uh, Will Williams is going to be presenting about a 20th century women-owned floral business um, that was uncovered actually on the grounds of the Montclair History Center um, at our property site. Uh, so Will Williams um, conducted this dig uh, on the grounds in July 2022, and he'll go into some more detail about that. Um, he is a PhD archaeology student at CUNY Graduate Center in New York City um, and an alumnus of Montclair State University. Um, so in 2022, um, him along with the leadership of Dr. Chris Matthews, who's also done some, some great um, other archaeological digs and presentations with us as well, they conducted these excavations um, at our property site, which is on 108 and 110 Orange Road. So a lot of those who do know our sites um, come out and see the Crane House and Historic YWCA Museum. But that building was not originally located on that property. So what we're going to be talking about um, is what was um, predating when the house was moved and what business was on that site um, that uncovered as a part of this dig. So it's really exciting. It's a it's a new history for us to learn more about. So we're really thrilled um, to welcome Will with us tonight. Um, I do want to just say for housekeeping, so I'll say once more, if you're more than 20 miles or more than two people, just put that in the chat. And our program tonight um, is generously funded by the New Jersey Council of Humanities, a state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we're thrilled to have their support uh, to host these free programs for you. So I'm gonna turn this over to Will and we'll get started this evening. Thanks everyone. Um, great, okay, hi, thank you very much. Um, so, so yeah, so my name is Will Williams. Um, I'm a PhD student at the, the CUNY Graduate Center in the, in the anthropology program uh, in, the, in the subfield of archaeology, um, and more specifically, uh, historical archaeology. Uh, so, so this presentation is, is titled A Rose in Suburban New Jersey, um, and it's about the, the archaeology and the history of a 19th and early 20th century florist and greenhouse in a rural, but it's a, in a steadily suburbanizing uh, Montclair in, in, the, in the early 20th century. And then this presentation, it also it builds upon a conference paper uh, that was presented earlier in February, and it contains a little bit of everything. Um, it's going to be a crash course in archaeology. Um, sort of a, an Archaeology 101, if you will. Um, and it'll be a review of the work that we did in 2022 um, with the with Montclair State University. Um, and it's going to have a little bit of the MHC's history um, to kind of put the, the period into context. Um, and we're going to take a, a look at the, the life of uh, Alice G. Rose, uh, who ran the business from approximately uh, 1916 to, to 1936. Uh, following her, her father's death in, in 1908. And, and Alice emerges in, as, a, uh, as a particularly important um, figure in this conversation, um, that she was, a, she, was a, she was a female business owner in the early 20th century. Um, and so we're going to be taking, taking a look at um, what evidence we have from, from the documentary record um, that, that builds her, her story. Um, so like I said, this is going to be a crash course in, in archaeology. Uh, we're going to be looking at archaeology and historical archaeology more specifically, and some of the ideas uh, and theories that, that, that form this type of uh, investigation. Um, and we're going to be looking at a, at a comparison between academic and, and cultural resource management, um, or, or CRM, um, which is this, this project kind of falls uh, very, very neatly between those, these two forms of archaeology. And, and we'll be looking at the phases of work uh, that archaeological projects that go through, um, which is also important for understanding how, um, how work has progressed from 2000, 2022 and, and the, the phases that it will go through in, in the future. Uh, we'll do an artifact review. Um, so what, what did we find and where did we find it? And, um, and how these how these artifacts that were distributed across the site. 
And, and as I said, we'll do a little bit of a history of the Montclair History Centre, um, but specifically looking at 110 to, to 112 Orange Road, um, which was the site of the former greenhouses. Uh, and then we'll look at A.D. Rose, um, Alistair D. Rose, uh, who purchased the business in 1899 and the, the expansion um, of the, the business and a fire that occurred in 1908. Um, and then following his death uh, later in 1908, um, we will look at the Alice's um, tenure at the business um, where it was renamed the Rosary. And uh, we'll look at, at gender roles in the early 20th century um, and how she kind of stands out within this, uh, within that, 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 that structure and conversation. Uh, we'll look at the future work um, that's being planned at the MHC. Uh, and then finally, we'll do we'll a summary and uh, acknowledgements. Um, so what is historic archaeology? Um, archaeology is, archaeology more broadly speaking, is a subfield of anthropology. Uh, it's one of the, the four fields, um, cultural, um, physical or biological anthropology and linguistics make up the other three. Um, and anthropology deals with uh, questions of who we are, uh, as opposed to um, historical processes and narratives. Um, so within historical archaeology, we have two definitions, two very broad definitions of, of how we could describe the, this field of research. Um, one would be that it would be societies, it would be the study of societies with a written record. So this, this would encompass societies going back 3,000 years at least with the, the invention of, of cuneiform. Uh, but in the context of, of how we're engaging with historical archaeology, it's we're defining it by the events that are occurring after 1492 um, and that the are leading to and the contributing to, to modernity. And so this, this version of historical archaeology, it's uh, it the what it studies is very um, so essentially uh, described by Charles Orsa as the study of colonialism, uh, Eurocentrism, capitalism, modernity, and, and globalism. And so we see with this, this definition of archaeology that the, the discipline, um, it looks a little bit different than Hollywood's representation um, of the discipline, um, despite Indy's lengthy career. Um, we don't we don't hunt priceless artifacts, um, but we use material culture, uh, the artifacts, the the things that we leave behind, to reveal and uh, to reveal how people lived and they experienced the world and how those experiences they they reverberate um, into the into the present. So yeah, no indie. Um, so there's two aspects to, to how we're looking at the archaeology at, uh, at the MHC. Um, the first is we're, we're looking for sensitive cultural historical resources that might be possibly damaged by future development. And so within this, we're satisfying this legal requirement to preserve heritage. So there's that side. And the other side is that the period that we're looking at, we're, it's, it's a period of great, uh, great social change in uh, both nationally and locally. Uh, women who were born in the late 19th century, they were casting off these Victorian values of domesticity. Um, and it's also around the time of the passing of the, of the 19th Amendment in, in 1921. And, and this, is, this is also, it's, uh, it's a, a physically and economically changing landscape um, in this part of New Jersey. It's where, it's where these rural lands, they're being transformed into both urban and suburban environments. Um, and then lastly, it also is offering us a view of race, uh, race, class, and gender. And uh, we understand that Alice's gender uh, was used to discriminate against her. And so this then this leads to the question, you know, how how is Alice, how did Alice Rose resist these gender norms? So how do we how do we how do we describe the phases of archaeological work? Um, and this is this is important to to kind of uh, lay the foundations of because it's, it's 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 describing the work that occurred in 2022 and and how that work will be uh, built upon in the future. Um, so phase one a uh, uh, phase one a investigation is looking at um, 
it's, it's basically it's a, it's a surface survey where we're walking a site, we're looking for for artifacts, we're looking for material culture that is evident on the surface. Where we're taking in the landscape and observable features, those uh, unmovable um, structures that that are immediately apparent to us. So this would be our, the, our most uh, our first step, our simplest form of of an archaeological investigation. In a phase one B, we're then we're looking below the surface. We're we're sampling the we're sampling those artifacts that's that's below. We're just looking for the presence of human activity through STPs or shovel test pit units. And and uh, there's an example in the in the bottom left hand corner um, of a shovel test pit. As you can see, it's basically it's a it's a fifty maybe it's about a fifty centimeter diameter hole that's dug in the ground. Um, we're we're just digging straight down. We're we're just looking for the presence of materials. Um, when we're the so when, then when we're moving on to phase twos, that's when we're expanding those STPs. Based upon the presence of uh, archaeological material, we're then systematically revealing the stratigraphy. That is the the soil the soil layers and and the artifacts, and we're uh, we're recording both uh, horizontally. The, the position of it and vertically and, and vertically as, as we're going down through those layers we're going down through time and so we're, we're recording this this both, both spatial and the, these temporal dimensions uh, and then finally a phase three um, this would be a site-wide ex excavation um, doesn't often occur uh, this would be for sites that are eligible for to go on the national register of historic places um, or if salvage archaeology um, is required, that is the, uh, a, a potentially important site might be um, completely demolished by developments or there are environmental factors impacting, um, impacting a site. And so we see uh, an example of an excavation unit um, up here in the top right. Um, and you, you can see it's, it's, everything is carefully revealed. You can see the stratigraphy in uh, as, as we're going down through the site. So why do archaeology at the MHC? Uh, so the, the work performed, uh, uh, the work was performed ahead of a planned improvements at the MHC and the MHC's parking area. Um, and this falls under that category of that cultural resource management or, or contract archaeology, uh, which is required to, to mitigate a site for, for sensitive cultural assets. And the goal of the goals here and really is to look for the effects of uh, on cultural resources and if the developments uh, will have an adverse uh, effect on historic properties. And, and CRM is typically typically required by sites that receive either federal funding or, or that are on federal land. However, this, this is not exclusive. Um, sometimes states or, or local municipalities that become involved. Um, and CRM. On a, on, a, on a more broadly understood uh, federal level, uh, it falls under a law called the Section 106 C, uh, which was created in 1966 uh, with the National Historic um, Preservations Act. Um, and contract archaeologists, they typically, they report to the, the national, the NEH, the, the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, various federal agencies that might be involved that, that could range from the, um, the, the, the military to the National Park Service. Um, they also report to the SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, and if the, the project is occurring on, on tribal lands, um, it'll be to the, to the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. Um, and like I said, also local governments, um, potentially they come, in, they come involved. So CRM it represents about 90% of the archeology span that's done in the United States. Uh, some universities, they have connections with CRM firms, with contracting firms, um, but academia, academia uh, it represents a, a smaller portion of, of archaeology in the U.S. Uh, 2020s, uh, 2020, 2022's archaeological work, it was, um, like I said, it was initiated by plans to expand upon the, the parking area and to improve access uh, at the MHC. Uh, and, and it ran, it ran, it was run over the summer, the summer break of 2022, and it was an all-volunteer crew. 
uh, made up of students from Monfair State University and some from Hunter. And it was it was purely experience based. This this wasn't a field score that was done for credit. And uh, and we had ten people on the crew, and we were typically running about two archaeologists per SDP, uh, with nineteen of uh, nineteen of those shovel test pits um, being excavated. And uh, and most of those SDPs they were they were in the parking lot area, so it was um, it was an area that had been uh, seen a lot of developments over the years. Um, so here we are. We got some we got some pictures from the dig in 2022. Uh, so the top left there, we have got some students that are screening uh, soil that's being recently excavated through a mesh, and then uh, looking for artifacts. They're extracting artifacts from that from that soil. Uh, the bottom left, uh, we got students again. They're working in the driveway area uh, where the planned expansion uh, to the driveway will will go, um, and then also up into to the grassy area where it's. Uh, where the new parking area will reach. Um, in the middle, um, that's Heba in red. She's a current MSU student um, who does a lot of a really amazing work in the lab. Um, and with this shot, it also gives you an idea of the, the material that we were working with in the parking lot. Um, There's a lot of dense rock. There was concrete, concrete chunks that have um, been, been imported in to, to level the road and a lot of other road material. Uh, making up these these surface levels, and uh, so this 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 material often made those digging very very slow. Uh, up in the top right, there's Efren and David uh, swinging a pickaxe. Uh, this also gives us an idea of how quickly and roughly STPs are dug. This isn't the the trowel and the slow removal of layers. Uh, this is we're not we're not recording the provenience of of artifacts in the soil. Um, but we're just merely looking for the presence of artifacts. And in the bottom right, there's a couple of examples of some hollow bricks uh, from a from a feature, um, which could be described as this an unmovable artifact. Um, and these these bricks they had uh, had makers stamps on them, and so we're hypothesizing that they they would have been used for drainage in the greenhouses. See the SDPs that the team excavated, uh, they were plotted on a five by five meter grid that was covering the center's car park um, or where the, those development plans were, uh, were indicated uh, the parking lots expansion would be. Um, and the, each of these test pits, like I say, was about 50 centimeters in diameter um, and it went down to about a minimum depth of 50 centimeters. And uh, as like I mentioned, those those decades of that leveling and that backfill, that that construction debris that was has been imported, um, often slowed down our digging, and in some cases um, we had to, uh, in a couple of cases we had to abandon an STP and then move um, our position a few meters uh, away from it. Um, but the majority of the STPs they were in the southern half of the property, so that was uh, just just parallel. Along with the Israel Crane House, there, um, that's one ten and one twelve Orange Road um, at the former location of the of the greenhouses. And, and the artifacts recovered; they they were consistent with the Florissant greenhouse. the The three primary materials uh, were redwares um, in the form of um, flower pots, uh, window glass used for the for the windows uh, in the greenhouses, and coal and coal ash. 89% uh, of the ceramics by weight were either those redware flower pots um, and, and comparatively refined earthenwares that we might see in, uh, in tea wares or in service wares uh, or in plates. They made up only one and a half percent of the entire ceramic weight. Uh, flat glass, which was used in those windows, uh, was unsurprisingly high um, considering they were greenhouses. And it was nearly three times more predominant than other glass shirts. The, the artifacts uh, recovered in the highest quantity, uh, despite the, the field crew only retaining about a 15% sample, was coal, uh, coal ash and slag. Um, however, the highest concentration of this material was uh, behind the Clark House, um, which we can see up here. Um, so so this, is a, this is a 1907 fire insurance map that's been overlaid with the locations of the STPs, which are represented by these red dots and the, and the STP numbers. 
the the red clouds that we're seeing these these are heat maps that showing the the density of of fuel uh, fuel artifacts uh, found in those STPs. Um, the Clark House, which is pointed out uh, by this label, uh, that's the only original building that's still standing on the on the map. Um, and so we're seeing that that high concentration of coal and coal ash is is almost behind the 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 Clark House. And so we can we can speculate that this material or this 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 dumping was a result of uh, household consumption for heating the house, maybe. Um, the pink building in the in this map um, is it, it represents a a fire resistant building. Uh, so pink was used in the sandborns to to show that buildings made of of brick usually were the, that they were fire resistant, um, and this was for insurance purposes. Um, and further down south, uh, further south of this at at SDP number thirty seven, we have another concentration of coal ash. Um, what we're thinking that might be is the 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 the, the household um, dumping or the household use of and, and dumping of coal ash from the the Rose's house, which is this this property in the in the bottom right hand corner. Um, that that was where the Rose's lived, and so so that kind of means possibly that the the ash that we're seeing in SDP thirty seven. Um, predates the construction of the, the greenhouses. Uh, here's a similar map. We're looking at the flower pot distribution. Um, flower pots, they were relatively distributed across the sites. Um, however, there's a much heavier concentration um, in the north of 110. Um, and this is up near the driveway entrance, and so this this possibly might be from either the destruction of the or when the place was demolished, um, or a fire that happened there in, in 1908. Um, and then lastly, we have the the flat grass flat glass distribution. Um, what's interesting about this one is the the glass is does not cover the the, the predominant area of the greenhouses, but again is concentrated in that north section. Uh, and so we have two hypotheses that maybe explain this distribution pattern. Um, one would be that the, it was the depth part of the demolition of the greenhouses, that when they were demolished, they were pushed northwards. Um, the debris was pushed north um, towards the driveway entrance, um, or it's the, it's, the, it's the leftover of the, um, the fire that occurred in 1908. And it was where firefighters they they used to gain entrance to the property to extinguish the uh, a fire that occurred in the boiler room. Uh, the brick features uh, there were three brick features that were found in STPs twenty three, twenty eight, and thirty three, um, and we identified those as features one, two, and three. Um, and so these objects, they could be the remains of the hothouse of the boiler room uh, that was used for heating the greenhouses. Um, and these, uh, and, and again, the structure is seen here uh, is, as that pink shaded building. Um, I, I had a recent conversation with a fellow archeologist um, who 15 years ago uh, excavated a greenhouse in, um, in New York. And uh, we were, I was describing to him these these features and the the brick type of brick material that we were finding, and the because of these these bricks that had this this, this hollowness to them, they were, they were formed. They weren't they were solid bricks, and he was he was suggesting that they might have been part of uh, drainage that was used in the greenhouses, um, or they were, they were sometimes used for for passing heat through the for the heating system of the greenhouses. Um, but I'm I'm gonna come back to these uh, to these features and these bricks um, a little bit more in this presentation. Um, so we have a we have a property timeline here. Um, but this timeline is um, it does not it doesn't provide an extensive site chronology and we're only covering here a lots 110 and 112. So those those areas where the greenhouses were. Uh, so pre sixteen seventy seven, Montclair was the the home of the Muncie Lenape tribe, 
Um, and following the, the conquests, occupation, and colonization by Western settlers in the 17th century, um, the territories that became Montclair in a land purchase, um, they, they extended the Newark colony um, within between uh, 77, 1677 and 1678. Uh, it was a few years later that the Cranes, led by Jasper Crane, uh, purchased and operated a farmstead here until 1851. Uh, after the period, after this, after a period of multiple owners between 51 and 85, we arrive at the, the period of this presentation, and that's um, between 1885 and 1936. Uh, and the MHC, for, for whom the original phase one site report um, and project was conducted uh, or prepared for, uh, was established in 1965 uh, to relocate the 18th century built Israel Crane House from its original location on Glenridge Avenue. The Nathaniel Crane House uh, was built in 1918 uh, and it was added to the MHC in 1973. And this building was moved from its current location uh, at 108 um, to the back of the property in 1894 to make way for the, for the Clark House uh, at 108 Orange Road. Uh, and the, the Clark House was finally added to the center's campus in 1984. So just a little bit of background of the uh, of where this project was located. So Alistair David Rose, uh, he was he was born in 1864 and he immigrated from Scotland uh, aged 18. Uh, he first resided in Brooklyn with his wife Sarah and their two daughters, Lavinia and Alice. Uh, the couple separated sometime before 1893, and well, we're not we're uncertain why they separated, um, but it's possible that Sarah died in 1901. Rose remarries in 1893 to Elizabeth Dewitt, um, and Polly, Rose's third daughter, was born in May 1893. In the in the following years, Rose worked as a gardener for several estates in New Jersey. Um, and he specialized in the care and the growing of chrysanthemums, um, which is uh, an important variety uh, for, the, for, his, for, his, for his later business. Uh, Rose took possession of the greenhouses at 110 and 112 uh, Orange Road um, in 1899 from Alexander Michi, who had run the business with his brothers since about 1885. Um, and we could say by all accounts that Rose was very successful in his new venture. Uh, he added green, he added a lot of new greenhouses. He installed heating. He employed at least two additional workers. And, and he was known in the industry circles for, for this variety of chrysanthemums that he named the, the Polly Rose after his youngest daughter. And uh, the florists, florist stocks that were printed in, in uh, industry publications in the 30s and 40s they, they show that this variety continued to be grown and was still known by his daughter's name. The, the Rose's greenhouse was estimated to be 975 square feet. And we, we get this, we get this estimate from those Sanborn fire maps. And it would have been a, a considerable investment. Uh, and in, in an 18, uh, 1883 publication, uh, prices for a 1,000 square foot heating system uh, cost between fifteen and thirty dollars per linear foot, uh, and and the estimated cost for the Rose's greenhouse would have been between two thousand one hundred and forty two hundred dollars in eighteen eighties currency, and that's between sixty three thousand and one hundred twenty seven thousand in two thousand twenty four. Uh, Rose appears to have found success in Montclair, uh, which is echoed in the trade journals that was mentioning his, uh, his sleek look of prosperity that speaks well for the business end of Montclair, um, to quote. And, and the previously referenced newspaper report um, in the, the New York Star Eagle on February 1st, uh, 1908, it, of, of the fire that occurred there, it confirms the purpose of the building. Um, the report discusses the fire in the greenhouses uh, caused by a defective flu near the boilers, and it costs uh, two, or caused two hundred dollars in damage uh, and an unknown loss to, to Rose's rare plants and flowers. And we see that this damage um, to the glass that would have occurred uh, this perhaps explains some of that that glass distribution pattern that we've seen in those previous maps. 
Alistair, Alistair Rose's death in 19, 1908 was preceded by at least five years of illness. Uh, a 1903 edition of the American Florist uh, comments, um, Rose is out again after illness, uh, full recovery and hustling to make up for lost time. Uh, and his obituary in the Florist Review uh, comments on his long illness uh, that culminated in his death uh, when he was 44. The, the 1906 Mueller map uh, it shows uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. D. Rose as the owner, uh, A. D. Rose as the owner of the property. Uh, so we, we can kind of ask then, you know, maybe Rose could have foreseen his you know, his illness. He could have seen his demise and transferred the ownership of the business to his wife. We don't know. Um, but later maps in 1907 they show that this, the ownership of the property is back with Alistair. Um, and then following Alistair's death, the, the business continues under Elizabeth with her stepdaughter, Alice, who's, who's then doing the bookkeeping. Um, but sometime between 1912 and 1916, Alice takes over the greenhouses and she becomes the sole proprietor. Uh, and she renames the business the Rosary. And although the census records, they're, they're showing that the, the, the family that were living on and off the property, um, the mother and daughter team, they, they maintain the business till at least 1936 when Alice passes. So Alice is emerging here as, as, this, as this important uh, part of the story, in, in part because of her long and approximately 20 year tenure at the Rosary, but also because she ran a woman owned business in a period when it was very uncommon for women. And Alice took the helm of the business at least four years before the passing of the 19th Amendment, uh, granting women suffrage. And, and Alice was part of the societal shift that, that saw women who came of age between 1890 and 1920, uh, who cast off these Victorian concepts of domesticity. And uh, Alice was, by every definition, she was a very, she was an independent woman. She, she remained unmarried. And she ran her own business twice as long as her father did. Um, and and she 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 also she did this in a male dominated industry that continued to to privilege male florists. Um, in Alice's twenty years as a florist, in her twenty years of running the business, there was no mention of her in the in the journals. Comparatively, her father frequented the the news columns of the Florist Review and the American Florist. Um, and women were, they were pervasively overlooked as professionals. Uh, and we see an example of this in the May 1900 edition of the American Florist. And the, the article's commentary of a flower show um, mentions that the highlight of the evening were these 27 varieties of chrysanthemums that were presented by an unnamed, quote, amateur lady. And But this article does go on to mention um, that she that she was a client of Alistair Rose, and it was her her named brother, C.H. Uh, Wilmer. Um, he was the one that accepted the award on behalf of her. Um, so Alice was she she was buried at Montclair Hebron at, at Mount Hebron Cemetery here in Montclair, uh, with her sister Lavini and her husband, and uh, and her mother and father. Um, their sister Polly, she she went on to become a communications manager in the floral industry, and she was buried in North Carolina. Um, and you can see on the the last line of this headstone here, we see Polly Drayton Carmen, uh, May 11, 1893, and as a birth date, but her her death date is uh, is left blank. So she 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 was buried further south. And we don't, we don't know if Alice received any formal training, uh, horticultural training, or if her experience was passed on by her father and stepmother. Um, however, her previous role at the flower shop as a bookkeeper, it suggests that her schooling uh, was more accounting based. Alice's uh, role as a florist and a business owner, it reflects uh, and possibly, uh, and she possibly leads the social change that's occurring during the, uh, the years of the First World War. Um, but she's not isolated in this. Uh, in 1911, uh, Jane, uh, Jane Brown Haynes, uh, a graduate of the, the Bryn Mawr College, um, was inspired by a tour of Europe to, to open the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women in, in Ambler, Pennsylvania, uh, which is now part of Temple University. Um, the, and the institution was the, the first school to, for specifically training women in the careers of food, medicinal, and ornamental plant growing. 
Uh, and with the, the labor requirements of the First World War, uh, the school saw an increase in, in enrollments. And um, like Alice's role as a business owner uh, and grower, uh, Haynes's school was a, it was a radical change from the roles that women previously occupied. Uh, so, so on this map, we're we're seeing the the future uh, future plans for archaeological work at the History Center. Um, in the, the middle of the map, we with the three uh, three green squares there. We these were those three features that were previously identified, and these we're hoping to expand these out into um, each being a meter meter and a half by a meter and a half. Um, phase two excavation units. So, so now we're, we're expanding on those those STPs where we're we're breaking them open to 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 document um, through time through this archaeological time um, what materials are, are involved in in these areas. Um, and likewise, we have another excavation unit that's planned in the top left hand corner, that, that blue square, that phase two point two. Um, that was actually a midden that was identified uh, by Montclair State University in 2013 or 2014. Uh, so the New Jersey Historical Trust, um, they've asked us to, uh, to open that up and see if there's any uh, cultural heritage there that's, that might be impacted by development. Uh, over on the right, we in this reddish area. Um, we're planning to put in four more STPs um, just to check for uh, activity any any cultural material that's that's below the surface in an area that's where the uh, the planning on expanding access to to the Nathaniel Crane House. And, and lastly, in this purple area uh, in the bottom right hand corner of the map, um, we're, we're proposing four more STPs, and this is going to be the the location where we believe the the Roses House would have existed. Um, and our, our questioning, our line of questioning for this for this research is just to locate the the house um, and with the potential for maybe future work after that. the The archaeology supporting the the Roses family history um, is important to the understanding of the, the social uh, the social landscape um, changes that are occurring in this part of New Jersey. So Alice, she's she's an exemplary example of these of changing attitudes towards gender and how women asserted independence in the early 20th century. Uh, and Alice's struggles aren't yet, they're not fully understood. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the, the information that we've been able to glean from from this project has come from the historical record. But we, we do we have at least an outline of our experiences in this urban setting, this suburban setting. I'm sorry. Um, and so, like I said, yeah. So the the knowledge of the roses it's mostly historical historical documents. Um, the the future work is 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 going to is will hopefully complement that and build out our understanding of the the operations of the greenhouses. Um, and this this project it also I, I believe it, it it increases our knowledge not just of Montclair History Center, but it's contributing to New New Jersey's transition from this from this. This semi-rural environment in the in the in the late nineteenth century into into this suburban environment that we that we know now, or contributed to is what we know now, um, and so yes, this um, this project um, wouldn't have been possible without the support involved of doctors at Montclair State University, um, and uh, and I want to say thank you to the two thousand and twenty two field team. Um, who all mentioned on this slide? Uh, we had a we had a great short field season. Um, and did a lot of great work. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Will. Um, I had a quick question just to start the ball rolling. And if anyone has any questions they want to put in the chat or or feel free to unmute, you're welcome to do that as well. This might be for future research. You know, was Montclair a space that had a number of florists at this time? Is that something that you came across in any of your research? Just out of curiosity. That's a great question. Um, I'm aware of one other florist that was, I, yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. So yes, yeah, so I'm aware of one florist that was at set the has a long heritage that's at the north end of Montclair at some grove. Um, there was also there was another 
um, there was another grower who predominantly featured uh, in the in those trade journals in those mm -hmm. early 20th century trade journals. So I I'm I'm gaining the impression that from the historical record uh, that the roses and and this one other grower there were there were these two predominant okay. um, people working in Malta. Interesting. And um, did Alice live? Um... I think you said they they had their house on the property. Did she um, and any other family members, did they live there until they passed or until the business closed? Do you know that as well? Looking at looking at the census records um, in the 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. I think they were, they were on and off the property. Um, but they were also living in West Coldwell. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know, but I can I can I can assume then that the house maybe was rented out, right? Um, while they maintained the business, um, but I guess that that's you know maybe the archaeological work might contribute to and more historical documentary research would contribute to that. Sure, and um, I know our collections manager tonight is listening, so you probably peaked. Um, we do a little research session on Fridays. You probably peaked our interest to look at some directories and census data as well um, to see if they were renting it. That's a good question. I'm curious about too. Uh, well, yeah, I, I'd I, love to see those, those documents too. Yeah, we'd be happy to share. Um, well, it, does anyone have a question they want to put in the chat or feel free to unmute and chime in? Is it known whether the business is run solely by the Rose family or I'm sorry, or whether they had other, um, you know, just general workers employed? Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so there, there was suggestion in, there was the, I recall a suggestion in one document um, that Alistair employed um, a couple of other, a couple of greenhouse workers. Um, that would have that would have been between eighteen ninety nine and, and 19, 1907, probably. Um, but otherwise, I, I I'm gaining the impression that this was this was a family business. Um, his his wife Elizabeth, I think, was working there with him, and um, Alice was doing the doing the bookkeeping for a while as well. Um, we got in the chat, um, Kathleen, thanks for your interesting thought. So um, one of the History Center's former properties at the Schultz House, um, there was a woman named Molly Schultz, who also was very active and not a florist business, but a, but a family business at the time. She was just wondering if they were um, connected in any way, but I think it was a generation off. So it might have been, could have been her aunt, Kathleen, um, her aunt mm -hmm. Emily, who also was um, and didn't marry, interestingly, single woman at the time, um, at the same time as Alice, who was perhaps active. Um, I believe I'm, if I'm doing the generation lines right, I have to match it up. So um, it's interesting. Yeah, who were who were her connections? Who were her the people she socialized with? You know, that's another question for Alice at that time. Was there, and there were growing women clubs in Montclair too. You know, at that exact time, the Upper Montclair Women's Club, but also the Montclair Women's Club right on Union Street. Um, although it, I think it moved there a bit later. Um, those are interesting thoughts. If she's on the records at any of those locations as well, for social activities, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was funny because uh, I was thinking the same thing yeah. since I've been, uh, you know, since I've been working um, uh, You cut um, out there, Deborah. Sorry. Oh, oh, uh, um, the Schultz things when we were writing those things up. Yeah. We um, got one comment in the chat, Will, um, that just came in from Rita. There was a gap on the timeline around the early 1900s. Thoughts on what happened to the property during that time? Okay. Yeah. So um, it was 18, 1899 uh, was when uh, Alice took over the business. Um, so that was between 1899 and 1908. That was the, the kind of, that was the, there was the era. There was the era of his occupation or his running of the business, um, and that was 
prior to 18, probably, probably 1900, uh, there was maybe two to three greenhouses on the property and, and Alistair expanded the business. Um, he, he at least doubled the, the number of square feet that he, that he had in the greenhouses. Um, so that, that, that ended with his death uh, in 1908. And that was when his wife, uh, Elizabeth, took it over until somewhere between 1912 and uh, 1916. Thanks, Will. Angelica, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Elise. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Williams, are you familiar at all with the J. Caldwell Williams Chestnut Hill Nurseries down the street on Harrison? They uh, they had a very, very old uh, business going. My grandfather bought their property in 1927 and developed South Brookwood, North Brookwood, and West Brookwood drives on that property. And I said that probably had a lot of things underneath the ground too that uh, nobody ever looked for when they were building the houses. But um, that yeah, also I'm, I'm was by the widow of the owner. When he died, she took over, Melita Williams. And uh, that has quite a history also okay. in Montclair. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be very interesting to um, find comparative sites or, or comparative businesses, even just looking for, through those historical documents to do a comparison between the Roses business and surrounding um, businesses. That would be an interesting extension of the investigation. Mm -hmm. um, and to those uh, additional dig or excavation sites also that we'll mention, um, for anyone interested, that's likely going to be happening this summer. Um, that we're we're planning some of that work, so we'll see what we also uncover. Um, but thank you, Elaine, for sharing that too. I'm really curious, yeah, who were the some of the other competitors or other comparative businesses at the time, and that was happening in Montclair. Well, excuse me. Um, nowadays, in 2024, when we say a florist, you're generally thinking of, you know, a shop that sells bouquets or maybe little house plants. Uh, in your usage of florists, were they more like landscape gardeners, like growing shrubs and and uh, you know flowering bushes for the outside of um, homes? Right. My 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 understanding, looking at it in this in this historical context, mm -hmm. is that the they're growing more potted plants, ornamental potted plants. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I, I'm not sure of their, their market, uh, but I but I'm assuming that they're all going into the city. Mm -hmm. So it's it's um, I, I believe that it's it's more of a it's it's not the it's not the arrangements uh, that that we typically associate with florists, but mm -hmm. more the 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 bulk products mm -hmm. that's coming from the growers. And I would guess the shards of pottery that you and the volunteers have uncovered, you know, really justify what you just said, you know, that, um, you know, you're not going to put a big shrub inside a, a little pot. You yeah. know, so, uh, you know, it, it does make sense that, you know, it was, uh, you know, what you described. Yeah. There's actually been some very interesting, um, there's, a, there's an interesting thesis, a master's thesis, on flower pots um, that was looking at the the drainage hole at the bottom of the pots um, and the and the form of some of them um, for 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 discussing their purposes um, and the the plants that they grew. Um, so you know, it, it might be another line of research. It could be understanding the type of vessel that would be. Um, suited for chrysanthemums because that's kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that the, the roses were growing um, and how that relates to that material culture those those pots that we're finding at the site as well uh, Francisco go ahead yep yeah just the uh, by the way William great presentation congratulations on that um, just to piggyback on that uh, line of thought, did you guys take um, soil samples and have you considered doing um, soil analysis and you know a little bit of archaeobotany to see if they, you can find 
if what type of plants they were growing or what type of or if they were growing That's a good idea. and not just rose yeah not just like that specific ornamental plants yeah that's that's a really good idea um so a lot of the the, the area where we were digging um it had it, it had multiple generations of of fill that was used to level out the parking area um and in in in, in amongst that in that matrix there was even just oil that i think was poured onto the surface to try and i don't know to compact the the road surface down a bit um but once you get below that, that's that's when we started seeing that 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 that, that more that cleaner soil, I guess you could say. Um, but that that could be a really good idea for uh, when we have to expand out the those STPs into units um, to to take more of a more comprehensive uh, sampling of the area. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another thought came in through the chat. Um, from Kim. She said about 35 or so years ago, she was gardening in the back of her yard and dug up a lot of broken plates, mugs, and glass. The house is 1880. Is this common? And do many of these older homes have um, buried bits of history such as that that occurs? Yeah. Um, I, I think you would probably find that a lot in, uh, in 19th century and early 20th century houses. Um, in in Montclair and I think New Jersey in general, before we had a, a municipal waste system, um, a lot of a lot of stuff went into into middens, into trash heaps that were in the backyard, um, and yeah, and the, they they can be a fascinating source sometimes for this, for the sampling of um, people's consumer preferences. That's a great way to put it. Their consumer preferences, yeah. <laughs> Um, and thanks, Cindy. Cindy just saying thank you um, and would be interested in the arche, uh, archaeobotany, if I'm saying that right, archaeobotany. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have another question. Kathleen Bennett here. Um, were these grand, greenhouses, were they, were they uh, planted in the ground, these plants, as in a field, or were they on tables in containers which would make it a different way to look at these things and looking and the other thought is that looking at descriptions and you mentioned that these flowers went into new york and you know for uh grand events that many of the um big events were decorated with chrysanthemums which i i always thought is sort of odd because we look I, I look at chrysanthemums as something being um every day but I think at the time the turn of the century they were very unique and um it, it, you know it was a flower that was not what we pick up at Home Depot in in today today so just some thoughts on that do you have any idea of how these greenhouses were used um so there's, there's a little bit of speculation uh currently still that ha has to be used looking at the features what we know of the features which we which we've only seen through this this very narrow opening into into the to the subsurface um that the they might have been uh, lined they might have had those those drainage tiles in them so so that complementing the fact that we have all these these flower pots that a lot mm. of redware flower pots that they were, they were grown inside the greenhouses in these containers uh, it wasn't necessarily we don't think it would have been um growing in the ground mm. um and for, you, for your second question um about the, the flower variety that's being grown I think that's there's there's been a lot of studies around the the semiotics that's in Victorian flowers and how they were they were used for conveying different messages. Um, I think that could be further research into into those uses of um, of, as, of flowers and flower arrangements as as this communication medium. Um, 
that would definitely complement or contribute to how we're understanding what the or what the roses were growing um, and the mm -hmm. markets and also that they were they were selling them to. It also okay. just made me think too um, what you both are saying, Will and Kathleen. You know that their business was during a very shifting time in Montclair with a lot of people coming in and building these larger estates or, or, you know, more development happening in Montclair, you know, if the clientele is New York city, but was there also a growing clientele for these big estates in Montclair mm -hmm. and what affairs were going on? So it'd be interesting too, if we ever came across the, the roses records of business, but you know, some things we may never uncover. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a florist, or I know very little about plants. But one of the things that I, I, I'm just been, it's been going around my head is that, uh, yeah, I suppose that you could do a minimal number of individuals on your pots. But the thing is that how sustainable? I mean, it's seasonal. I mean, you have to grow roses seasonally, but how sustainable? How what's the bulk amount that you have to grow uh, in terms of flowers in order to provide to these big events? And uh, I mean, and if there are, you know, if that's the only area where they're growing stuff, uh, I mean, definitely a greenhouse, right? So the, it's a, some sort of control in the environment. Uh, but the idea of if, if plants are growing also in bushes outside that are a little bit more hardy that respond to seasons, I mean, I, I wonder if that's a, I think that that's why soil analysis and maybe some pollen analysis from, from your soils would be really interesting. But that's the, the main question that I have right now is like, how sustainable? Because I mean, a rose bush uh, is going to yield just a limited amount of roses before having another yield. So I don't know. Yeah. And, and I think that that question could be further complicated by, so we, we have some heating that's going on but how much of the greenhouses was heated? I mean, was it was it just did he have just a hot house, or or was it a boiler room that was used to pipe heat into the rest of the into the rest of the, the greenhouses? Um, and that would you know that would obviously I think changes um, change the yield out quite a lot. Um, but I think that would be that could be a really interesting line of research is to. To kind of estimate the yield, the potential for a for a heated greenhouse versus a non-heated greenhouse, and the the growing times to kind of get like an economic sense of of the business as well, you know, and how profitable they were. Also, as a, as a, a different line of thought, and has to do with your ceramics. Um, do you do you know where the where the pots were being made? I mean, you said that there was a masters uh, that were looking into the the holes and the typology of the uh, of the ceramics. But uh, I mean, I probably this, this maybe is just like not for this project, but maybe for someone trying to link like economic uh, economically that state and consume uh, consume. Um, probably like how how people are consuming certain uh products in this case pots but I, I would be really interested to see if it is local productions and you know but i suppose that in order to do that you would have to do something like neutral neutron activation analysis and if you have like you know samples of your of your clays yeah the pots um so before 1860 um flower pots they they were often made by apprentices um, in mm -hmm. in larger um, pottery institutions, I guess. Um, so the you know they were made for practicing on by apprentices to to perfect their their trade. Um, but then you get after eighteen sixty, there was a, a patented um, molding mass manufacturing um, machine. So I think from from what I'm recalling of the assemblage is we we're, we're seeing evidence of some uh handmade pots you you can see those uh you can see where they've been turned um but there's also evidence of pots that have gone through those those stamped mass manufacturing molds as well so there's, there's a bit of there's a bit of both happening i think here yeah that sounds really really interesting yeah, as... interesting thought yeah and you're right i mean it is during the time where you have industrialization so i think that it makes yeah. it makes
Well, excuse me. How did you get your volunteers? Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, pe people at Montclair State University is looking for some field experience. Uh -huh. um, without the without the commitment of a of a full field school, um, and and yes, and some people that we've been working with, we had some people from Hunter College in the city, um, who are part who who are attached to previous projects. Um, so it was kind of word of mouth and people just knowing each other, uh, really. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions? I and just have one more thought. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, because Schultz produced bricks, which is clay terracotta. And it would be fascinating if to come full circle, if, you know, this clay source was really a, a, a Schultz source. Just a thought. Yeah. It's possible. Um, they marked a lot. They would put marks on their bricks as well. So be curious if anything was printed on any of the bricks uncovered. Um, perhaps we'll find out when we do more of that field work in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's fascinating. Great, 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 great project. Yeah. Thank you. And and thanks um for Kim. If anyone's curious a little bit more on the the history and the appeal of uh the chrysanthemums, um she put a little bit in the chat. So it certainly was gaining popularity and considered um a special and beautiful um, variety of, of of flowers at the time, even though today, Wendy, we don't think of it that way. <laughs> so thank you so much, Will. This was fantastic. We're excited as we continue to learn more. You know, it's an ongoing process and project. So everyone stay tuned. Um, we'll have more information as time goes on and the next dig is conducted on site. So appreciate everyone's time and for coming out. If you want to come visit the grounds of the History Center just to see the site. Um, it's always open to the public to do that. And the museum itself is open every Sunday, including this coming Sunday from 12 to 3. Um, interesting how we're we're now really um, focusing in on a lot of the groundworks and gardens on this site. So it's giving a nice little historical nod to what perhaps the original tension, intention of the property was during that time period. So um, that makes me smile a bit as well. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you for having me.